Well, ladies and gentlemen, welcome. Uh, this is the Center for Appalachian Studies, and we have a really extraordinary person that is going to be with us tonight and share with us what might be a memoir, but is a really good tale and a wonderful story, uh, When the Center Held True, a novel by Corley Dennison. But first of all, I want to say that the way we're going to structure this tonight is uh, Corley is going to do the reading. He will do that for about 30 minutes or so, 40 minutes or so. And then we're going to sit down here, the two of us together, as a matter of fact. I'm going to sit down there while he's reading. But when he finishes and he comes over here and sits down, I'll come up and sit down with him. And I'll get us started by asking a couple of questions to Corley about the writing of this book and his work and how he came about this wonderful story. And uh, then we'll open it up for you all to ask questions as well. I will tell you that I got so engaged in this book because I'm a child of the 60s and the 70s, and he did so much, I think, to make this story a living story that uh, just really captures your interest. I also want to say welcome to all of those people that are live streaming out there, lifelong learners, sale members, people, uh, my students as well, who are home and, and are listening to this. Uh, we feel very blessed now that we have a wonderful way to bring uh, writers and uh, people to you and for you to hear them, not only in person, but also virtually as well. So this was maybe the one good thing that happened as a result of the pandemic. Not much was good about the pandemic, but it is nice that we've become much more versatile in our classes and the like. It really gives me, oh, and I want to mention to you as well that when we finish with this, and we will be finished about 7.30, we'll try to end it then, uh, please join us for the reception that will be out in the atrium. Also, Corley is going to be signing books, and we have Four Seasons here who will uh, be selling the books. So please uh, uh, join us out there and stay with us a little bit when all of this is over. So we're in for a real treat tonight. Uh, you have a program. I hope that you will look at that program and you can read about Corley Dennison. I have known Corley and also his wife, Betty, for a long, long time. When I was advisory council of faculty member and the chair of that organization for a short period of time, it was really a pleasure to work with Corley and with Betty as well. Betty is a teacher and Corley is an administrator and he was also then the vice chancellor uh, for Academic Affairs for the Higher Education Policy Commission. I won't go through all of that. You can read about it, but I am going to say that it was always such a pleasure to work with both Corley and Betty. And then it was a pleasure to uh, meet their son, Brandon Dennison. This is an extraordinary family. We are so lucky in West Virginia to have this remarkable family. And now we're going to have the opportunity to hear a little bit about growing up in the 1960s, the 1970s, at a period of time when maybe a lot was a lot plainer and easier to see. But on the other hand, this was a chaotic period for the South, for Appalachia. Here is Corley Dennison to talk about and to read from When the Center Held True, a novel. Welcome, Corley. And thank you, Sylvia, for that introduction. It's always a pleasure to be in Shepherdstown. Actually, I think Shepherdstown is the most charming town in the state of West Virginia, and so it's always a pleasure to, uh, to, to visit uh, Shepherdstown. So before I talk about the inside of the book, I'd like to talk about the cover of my book for a moment. Um, you know, they say you can't judge a book by its cover, and, and I actually, you know, where did that come from? So I looked it up, and there was a novel by a guy named George Eliot, in 1860, and it was uh, called Mill on the Floss, whatever that is, was the name of the book. And so supposedly that's where the phrase was first used. Uh, then it was popularized in the 20th century uh, by a, a, a book, um, uh, Fuller and Rolfe were the authors, and the name of the book was Murder in the Glass. And apparently they used that phrase, you can't judge a book by its cover. Well, I don't know about that, but, but uh, my publisher really insisted that we have good cover art. Because some people come into a bookstore with purpose. You know, they read, a, they read a review online or they read a review in the newspaper 
and they decide that they're going to go in and buy that book. Other people come in and browse. And so the question is, what is going to make that person pick your book over the other dozens of books that are, that are sitting around on the shelf? So I, I just thought I would tell you about this because it is, a, it is an important part of the publishing side of it and, and the way that, that, that the whole thing evolved. And so uh, uh, Patrick Grace, who's my publisher, he introduced me to a, a Huntington artist named, uh, uh, shoot, now Debbie Richardson. <laughs> and so he introduced me to Debbie Richardson. And so I said, I would like you to bring the town, the fictional town of Jeffrey Courthouse to life on the cover. And she goes, well, I have painted a number of cityscapes and, and townscapes. I don't know if you can see this or not, but she showed me this picture. And so this is a, a picture of Barbersville, West Virginia. Uh, and this is, this is a town near where I live. And this is one of the main drags in Barbersville. It's Central Avenue. Main Street's going this way, and that's, that's Central Avenue that you're looking at. And so uh, I said, yeah, you know, I like, I, like, I like what you've done here, but I want hills uh, and I want more of a Virginia ambience to the town. Uh, so she found she found this picture, which is actually a picture of nearby Winchester, and it's from the it's from the late seventies. And so I like the brick streets, and I like the fact that all the buildings were kind of matching brick. And and so you know we decided we were going to put hills behind it. And so just just a note: the reason the name of the town is Jeffrey Courthouse is because in old Virginia. Courthouse was the name associated with the county seat. So we know that Lee surrendered to Grant at Appomattox Courthouse. He didn't surrender in the courthouse. He surrendered in the Wilbur McLean House, but the town was Appomattox Courthouse. So in old Virginia, their county seat had the name Courthouse in the name of the town. So this is Jeffrey Courthouse, which is the county seat of Jeffrey County, and then hence Jeff Jeffrey Courthouse. So um, after, after we looked at you know, this picture, we looked at the picture of Barbara. I know you can't see this, but she made a pencil drawing. This is the pencil drawing. And so we went back and we, we changed the names of the, of the stores uh, and, the, and the businesses because there was, I wanted references to what was, what was in the book. Uh, of course, she put hills behind it. And that's how we came up with this, with this cover. And I really, think, I really think she did a wonderful job. And I was very pleased that, that, uh, that Patrick hooked me up with her. And she did a great job. So, with that, let's get to the inside of the book. <clears throat> Past is prologue. A former student of mine, Heath Harrison, at the Ohio, uh, Ironton, Ohio Tribune, wrote that as the opening line of his book review. And he asked me, why write a historical fiction? So I had to think a minute. Sometimes studying the past can provide us with a hint or a glimpse into the future. History doesn't necessarily repeat itself. However, it often reveals patterns or trends that can advise us on our path forward. I decided to set my novel in the late 1960s because I realized how many issues in the book are still issues and controversies facing our society today. Here's a few examples. Race and race relations, voting rights and voting access, school board controversies, and deep cultural divides, all issues faced by characters in the book and still issues that are relevant today. When the center held true is my first novel, it's a coming of age story of a young man, Clay Spurgeon, who's white and is born in the fictional county of Thacker, West Virginia. In the summer of 1963, Clay and his family joined the great Appalachian migration northward. Now, I used that phrase because I was at the Campus Mauritius Museum in Marietta, Ohio, and they had a display, the Great Appalachian Migration, and I was looking, and I thought, wow, you know, I'm part of history, you know, look, it's, you know, kind of like the, you know, the wagon trains out to Oregon or something, and I was part of the Great Appalachian Migration. So Clay was part of the Great Appalachian Migration northward with a move to Ohio, where Slim, Clay's father, will work for Tyndall Manufacturing, a company that contracts for the U.S. Navy. Later in the novel, the family moves again with a transfer to a new factory being opened by Tyndall in Jeffrey County, Virginia. When Clay moves to Ohio, he gets into a number of fist fights because he talks with a, happy, uh, a heavy Appalachian drawl. The principal of his new school and his mother decide he might fit in better if he takes speech lessons to flatten his drawl. Clay feels in Ohio he's stereotyped as a stupid hillbilly, and later in Virginia he's categorized as a damn Yankee. 
Clay is the only child of Marge and Clay Spurgeon Jr., or Slim as he is known. Slim is a six foot seven, 245 pound former Marine and a welder. Slim gave up a basketball scholarship in college to go to World War II. He never returned to finish his degree. His one great expectation for Clay is that he'll get a college degree and work a good job. When the family moves to Virginia, they encounter the last of Jim Crow or state-sponsored segregation. Clay and his family want to do the right thing but struggle to find a moral response to an immoral system. One vestige of segregation still in place in Virginia is freedom of choice. This is a law that requires students and their families the freedom to choose where they will attend public school in their home county. In 1968, the U.S. Supreme Court throws out freedom of choice as a de facto system of segregation, writing that the burden of desegregation must shift from the student to the state. Clay also plays football and is a starting center on his high school football team. The team becomes a microcosm of the larger struggle to integrate Jeffrey County. Radio plays a big part in this novel, as you'll see in my reading, as Clay volunteers to do an air shift for a local college station, Marianna Randolph Custis College. That happens to be Robert E. Lee's wife's name. <laughs> so it's a selective woman's college emblematic of the Old South. However, through the radio station, Clay lands a part-time job as a stringer for UPI. This places Clay at the center of local government meetings as the county struggles to fulfill the federal integration mandate. The novel opens on the day John Kennedy was assassinated, November 22nd, 1963. Why that day? Because it was JFK that introduced the Civil Rights Bill. It was stalled in a Senate committee with little hope of passage. It took Lyndon Johnson's cajoling and asking that a grieving nation remember a martyr to push the bill to the finish line. So the selection I'm going to read opens on the day of the assassination. Clay has been sent home from school and is watching the news coverage. He remembers back to the West Virginia primary campaign of 1960 and a dinner with cousin Alf. Alf is a Democratic Party operative and has all of the inside scoop on state politics. Let me take a drink here before I start. <clears throat> Alf came to Sunday dinners only every now and then. When he did come, the conversation always turned to politics. Alf had jumped on the Kennedy bandwagon early on. Most of the establishment Democrats in Thacker County were supporting Humphrey. Alf seemed to be one of those people that usually ended up at the right place at the right time. He went to work for the Kennedy organization in the winter of 1960, and it wasn't long before all of the Democratic political operatives around the country realized what an important primary West Virginia would be for the Kennedys. Clay remembered Alf and Slim sitting in Granny Lulabelle's living room, waiting for Sunday dinner to be served. <laughs> Excuse me. Alf sat on the couch beside Clay. He leaned forward, motioning with his hands, as he tried to convince Slim to do some organizing work for the Kennedy campaign. Slim, you know, there's never been a Catholic president. Some people think Kennedy's loyalty would be to the Pope and not the Constitution. Well, we know that's bull. So West Virginia has one of the smallest percentages of Catholic population in the country. Yes, sir, that's right. So if Kennedy can win here, he can win anywhere. At least that's the way the thinking goes. Slim sat with one leg crossed over his knee in the easy chair across the room. He nodded his understanding. <clears throat> Alf continued, Kennedy will give a national speech to address the Pope stuff. Here in West Virginia, we want to get him and his wife out to as many up-close, in-person meetings as we can. You know, union halls, coffee shops, places like that. You think you could put together a reception at the Boilermakers Hall for the Kennedys? Slim tightened his lips in thought, took a quick look at the ceiling, then nodded his head. Yeah, I think we could do a reception. I'll talk to the local le leadership. When would you want to do this? In the spring, closer to the primary, let me tell you, Jack Kennedy has an electric personality. Women want him and men want to be like him. Then there's his wife. Have you seen any pictures of her? Yes, sir. She looks like a model off the page of a fashion magazine. The men want her and the women want to be like her. Yes, sir. Alf chuckled at his own joke. Clay thought about the Kennedy motorcade that came through Thacker County on its way to Clarksburg. It was a beautiful spring day. Throngs of people lined both sides of the street. Kennedy was sitting in the back of the convertible with Jackie, probably just like he was earlier today. 
Kennedy was waving to the crowd, occasionally reaching up to pull his hair back off of his forehead. Clay recalled looking straight into the back seat of the car, hoping to make eye contact. It wasn't Jack that returned his gaze. It was Jackie. Clay thought for sure when she had turned, her eyes met his. She raised a white gloved hand and gave a quick wave with just a hint of a smile on her lips. Clay felt their eyes had met for just that moment. Then she turned to wave to people on the other side of the street. Now she's standing there on the TV with blood splotched all over her dress. After Kennedy had won the primary, Alf came to a Sunday dinner with stories from the trenches. He told one story in particular that Clay remembered well. Marge and Granny Lulabelle had fixed a roast with parsley potatoes, cooked carrots, and onions. Alf wore suspenders, bow ties, and fedoras, usually with a yellow or blue Oxford shirt. At the moment, Alf's shirt was covered with a white linen napkin tucked neatly into his collar. He waved his table knife around like a pointer, taking a brief break to butter his biscuit. He bit into his biscuit and continued with his story. So the Humphrey people already know that Kennedy has 10 times the charisma that Hubert has. I mean, Hubert can talk about farm prices, income tax rates, or whatever. As soon as Kennedy starts talking about his vision for America, especially into a TV camera, well, the Humphrey people know Hubert can talk all the facts and figures he wants, but nobody's listening. Alf cut off a piece of beef and stabbed the potato and chewed for a second or two and then continued. What do you do when you're behind an eight ball like that? You cheat. That's what you do. Alf punched his fork in the air in the general direction of Slim's seat. Yes, sir, you cheat. The Humphrey people went to all the precinct bosses in this county and every county around us. He went down in the coal fields and talked to the unions. What would it take to buy your votes? Yes, sir, his people asked that as a direct question. What can we do to buy your vote? This time, Al paused to take a sip of sweet tea, a bite of biscuit, and another sip of tea. The precinct bosses told the Humphrey people it'd take about 400 bucks per precinct, plus you gotta put some money in the boss's pockets. So Humphrey thinks he's got the cat in the bag. Kennedy can talk all the fancy talk he wants. Alf, Lulabelle asked, how do the bosses use the money? How do you pay it out? Alf wiped his lips and pulled the napkin out of his collar. You ever seen any of those little tiny bottles of liquor the airlines use? Well, I, I know what they are. I'm not sure I've seen one. Well, you buy a case of those, you put a $2 bill behind the matches in the matchbook. The bosses tell you how to vote. You show up at the polls, tell the worker you don't understand how to work the voting machine. The worker comes over to help you, make sure you pull the right lever, then waves as you leave the booth. When you're outside, you get to choose between a book of matches with a hidden $2 bill or a little bottle of liquor. It's easy. <laughs> Alf continues. The Kennedy people find out what Humphrey's up to, so they go to the bosses and ask, what would it take to get you to switch your vote? The bosses say, hmm, Humphrey paid us four per precinct. You'd have to go to at least five. The Kennedy guys say they can do it. They just need to make arrangements with their people in Chicago. Alf finished his tea and rattled the ice in the glass. So now I find myself waiting down at the old lumber yard. Sure enough, here comes a car up the dirt road with no lights on. Alf pointed his finger and moved his hand as though tracing a line on a map. This old Willis Jeep pulls up, you know, the kind with the wood on the side. One of the guys I'm with knows one of the guys in the car. They shake hands. The guy in the car pulls these big suitcases out of the back. They just throw them on the ground, hop back in the car, and drive away. Alf smiled as Granny Lulabelle picked up his plate. Sure was good, Lulabelle, as always, real good. My God, these suitcases are really heavy. So we open them up. When the bosses told the Kennedy people it'd take five to buy the precinct, they meant 500. The Kennedy people thought they meant 5,000. There were hundreds of thousands of dollars in each suitcase. The Humphrey people never knew what hit them. <laughs> Lulabelle came back in the room holding two dessert plates. Alf, do you want a piece of chocolate pie? Absolutely, I'd never pass up a piece of your chocolate meringue pie, Lulabelle. Alf picked up his fork and paused before taking a bite. Every vote got paid, every precinct boss got paid, and every union fund and every teacher's flower fund and every county around here is full to the brim. Yes, sir, he took a bite of pie and smiled like the cat that ate the canary. <laughs> so that was the first section. Now we're going to, um, the next two segments are going to, we're going to deal with radio. Radio played an important part <clears throat> in Clay's life. <clears throat> he lived in a home where radio was on for a large part of the day. That part's autobiographical. My mother listened to radio quite often, in fact, practically all the time, especially in the mornings when she did her housework. 
My mother told me she was listening to a musical variety show on the radio Sunday afternoon, December the 7th, 1941, when regular programming was interrupted to announce the bombing of Pearl Harbor. My mother was 10 years old and didn't know where Pearl Harbor was, so she ran into another room to tell her parents what she had heard. I think my mother came by her affinity for radio for her mother, from her mother. I remember my grandmother listening to the radio as she ironed or washed dishes. In fact, one of my earliest memories was my grandmother asking me to be quiet or play in another room so she could sit down and listen to her story on the radio. This was the mid to late 50s and must have been one of the last soap operas still on the radio. It wasn't long before she was sitting in front of the TV to watch As the World Turns. This segment opens with Marge, who's very musical, practicing on her guitar and asking Clay to practice with her. The session's not going very well. Clay remembers a story his mother told him about performing on a professional show with some regulars from WWVA's Wheeling Jamboree. This segment is a greatly embellished version of a story my mother related to me when she was asked to flatfoot at a local concert. I picked the Wheeling Jamboree because of its history in West Virginia and Appalachia. WWVA is West Virginia's only clear channel AM radio station. It can be heard over most of the eastern U.S. I think it's like 32 states, actually. The station went on the air on December 13, 1926. In January 1933, the Jamboree premiered and soon rivaled the Grand Old Opry for listenership. In fact, CBS Radio carried the show for several years on Saturday nights, the same night as the Opry. And I think the Opry was 8 to 10 Central Time, which would have been 9 to 11 here. And then the Opry came on from 11, or the Jamboree came on from 11 to 1. During World War II, Armed Forces Radio broadcast the Jamboree to troops serving overseas. By the early 2000s, WWVA had been purchased by Clear Channel Radio, and the format was switched from country to talk radio. The Jamboree had a number of regulars that appeared each week on the show with names such as the Radio Rangerettes, the Sparkling Four, and the Log Cabin Girls. One of the most popular acts was a, name, a man named Lewis Marshall Jones with the stage name of Grandpa. He had two stints on the show, the 1936 and then the 37 season, and then he had, uh, was a frequent guest on the show from 1941 to 1943 when he enlisted in the Army. It was during Grandpa's time in Wheeling that another cast member, Cousin Emmy, showed him how to play the banjo in the mountain claw hammer style, that became a major part of his act, and he played claw hammer banjo on most of his radio hits. Grandpa Jones is the only real name I use in this segment. The rest of the acts I just simply made up. Grandpa would go on to be a regular on the TV show Hee Haw, which was a popular syndicated TV program in the late 1960s and 1970s. For those of you who have never seen Hee Haw, it was a series of fast-paced corn pone jokes and comedy skits with musical acts in between. Grandpa Jones used to have this segment where he was cleaning a window and he had a rag, and he was looked like he was cleaning a window, and the faux audience would go, Hey, Grandpa, what's for dinner? And he'd stop and stick his head through the window and go, We're having squirrel and dumplings, collard greens, black-eyed peas, and corn pone. And the audience would go, Yum, yum. And so they did, that was, they hit different, that was the skit that they did every week. So this segment opens up with Marge and Clay practicing guitar. Then Clay remembers the story Marge told him about getting the flat foot with the Jamboree Stars. Clay returned from the first baseball practice of the season in mid-March to find his mother sitting in front of the stereo with her guitar. She had just picked up the tone arm from the record. Oh, hi, Clay. How was practice? It was good. I think I have a real shot at first base. Maybe pitch, too. What are you doing? I'm trying to get the cording down for the song Walk Right In by the Rooftop Singers. This is a good song for the sister sing-along. Your dad's running errands. It'll be a while. Get the guitar I got for you in Christmas over there in the corner. Practice with me. Okay, but the tuning pegs won't stay tightened. It's probably out of tune again. I know, I just tuned it. It's an old guitar. I got it used. If you practice and get your chords down, we can get you a better one somewhere down the road. Now pick up your guitar. We're going to start in G. Strum the strings with G. Strum twice. G, G. Now F sharp, F. Good. Clay strummed along with Marge as they repeated the chords several times. Then Marge stopped. Didn't you hear that chord change? That went from A to D. No, Mom, I didn't. It was hard practicing with Marge sometimes because she was such a natural at music. She didn't always understand you were not necessarily hearing the same thing she was. Clay suspected 
His musical abilities might lean more toward his father's skill set than his mother. Slim couldn't carry a tune if it had a handle on it. However, he was happy to encourage his wife to sing and drink on Saturdays and holidays. Marge told Clay that her one appearance in a professional show had been in 1941 at age 10. The North Thacker town fathers needed to raise money for a new fire truck and managed to land Grandpa Jones with some of his former Wheeling Jamboree radio pals. Jones agreed to do a charity show and dinner to support the effort. The bill included Grandpa, Sugar and Spice, Fred Baker's Farm Girls, and Jake Luna and his Lumberjacks. Jake decided it would be a nice touch to have a few of the local girls do some flat footing during one of his hoedown numbers. Marge had learned to flat foot about the same time she'd learned to walk, so she was one of the lucky girls picked for the show. When the big night came, the high school gym floor was crowded with tables and jamboree music bands. People came from as far away as Clarksburg to see the show. High school majorettes served the meals while the basketball team bussed the tables. They even opened up the bleachers to let people in that couldn't afford the dinner. The place was simply packed. Marge wore her best dress, but she really didn't have the shoes to go with the dress. She borrowed a pair of Mary Janes from her sister. They were a little big, but some wadded up newspaper in the toe did the trick. She had to be at the gym that afternoon to practice the routine. Everything went fine. She was all excited. That evening, Marge and the girls waited in the wings for Jake and the Lumberjacks to go into their breakdown. A stage manager waved the girls on stage. Here they came, clomping and stomping with the crowd. The decibel level was louder than an airplane motor. Clapping, yelling, the music and the crowd merging into one. The arranger wanted the girls to do this little kick at the end of their routine. As Marge did the kick on cue, her Mary Jane flew off of her right foot in a high arc, spinning toe over heel before landing at a piece of cake at the head table. The mayor's wife nearly jumped out of her seat. Marge was mortified. Fortunately, it was time to leave the stage, so she ran off, leaving her sister's shoe on the table in the cake. She sat in the wing to watch the rest of the show, too embarrassed to go out and join the crowd. Mother Lulabelle came backstage with the shoe after the show. Don't worry, you were good, Lulabelle said. That shoe thing, it could happen to anybody. In the next scene, Clay is introduced to the business of radio. While working a summer job with his uncle at the town pool, Clay puts together some surplus audio equipment to DJ a dance for a Friday night pool party. A real DJ at the local radio station introduces himself to Clay and invites him to come over to the, to the station to see how radio works. Clay eagerly accepts the offer. In 1967, the year the pool party takes place, AM Top 40 Radio is still at its zenith, but things are about to change. After his move to Virginia, Clay lands a Sunday morning jazz show as a community volunteer on the campus radio station at Custis College. The station is what the FCC at that time would call a Class D FM educational station. Technology is about to evolve and bring FM radio to the forefront of cultural change. By the 1960s and into the early 70s, FM radio tuners had become standard equipment on most American cars, providing easy, easy consumer access to the FM band. The FCC also passed a rule that said you couldn't duplicate programming on the FM signal, so they had to come up with original programming. In 1967, President Lyndon Johnson signed the Public Broadcasting Act. That created the Corporation for Public Broadcasting that in turn created NPR and PBS. A number of the small Class D educational stations, similar to the one where Clay is doing his Sunday morning air shift, received government funding and power increases to become the foundation for NPR. Clay is unaware of all this in the summer of 1967 when he steps into the small AM station in North Thacker, West Virginia. He's just trying not to look too excited as DJ P. Diamond shows him how to work the equipment at the station. So he's going to go to uh, radio in North Thacker, West Virginia. Clay hung out at Brad Terrence's house until about 9 o'clock or so when he called Pete to tell him he was coming over to the station. Pete directed Clay to a back door he said would be propped open. Main Street of downtown North Thacker was literally carved out of the side of a hill. The buildings on the west side of the street were overshadowed by a steep rising ridge the locals called Town Hill. If you went around to the end of the block, there was a very narrow alleyway between the back of the stores and the hillside. An old cut stone retaining wall seemed to groan with the weight of the hillside behind it. The brick alley was just wide enough for the trash cans and for the door to fully open. Clay saw the light from the open door spilling onto the bricks of the alley floor. 
He stepped into the station and heard someone talking. As he moved past the pool of light in the doorway, he pulled the door shut. There were three interior windows on the right side of the hall. Each window revealed a studio. The first two windows were dark, but at the third window, he could see Pete flipping a switch. The sound of Jefferson Airplane, Somebody to Love, filled the hallway. Pete waved his hand for Clay to come in as he hung his headphones on the mic stand. Hey, welcome to the Saturday Night Rock and Roll Show. You got the beat with Pete on 1420, the station for all the hits. This is pretty cool. Clay tried, Clay tried to take it all in without looking too excited. Pete sat in front of a steel gray console with 10 black knobs across the front. A turntable was at each side of the console. A rack with 45 RPM records and what looked like tape cartridges sat between the turntable and the console on one side. A phone and a reel-to-reel -reel tape recorder sat on the console, uh, between the console and the turntable on the other side. Pete held a record up in the air to get Clay's attention. Let me show you how to cue up your records so there are no delays in your show. Pete placed the record on the turntable. Okay, this knob or potentiometer or pot, as we like to call it, controls the volume. Turn it all the way to the left until it clicks. This is called Q. Clay raised an eyebrow. He just realized what Q was on the audio console back at the pool. Clay con or Pete continued, Q puts you over to another speaker that's off the air, but you can hear it. Now look at the turntable. The lever there that looks like a gear shift, put it in neutral. See, that lets you freely spin the turntable. Put your, tone, uh, put your tone arm on the record. Turn the turntable until you hear the first sound on the record. Once you hear that first sound, back your turntable up one half turn. Clay nodded his head that he understood everything so far. The Jefferson Airplane song was beginning to fade. Pete simply threw the switch on the console, then on the waiting turntable, and right on cue, Friday on my mind started playing over the air. See? Easy peasy. The phone rang. It's the request line. Pete reached over to a reel-to-reel -reel tape deck to push a red button. The reel started turning slowly. He picked up a receiver. 1420 request line, you got the beat with Pete. Hey, we got a party going on here. Can you play Arthur Conley, Sweet Soul Music? We sure can. We'll get that on right away. You're the best, Pete. Pete hung up the phone, stopped the recorder, turned a knob on the console to the left to put it in cue, then wound the reels backwards until he heard the start of the phone conversation. He turned the knob up before going to the record rack, thumbing through the records to find Arthur Conley. Old Arthur is just about off the top 40 list this week, but we can play him a few more times. Pete queued up the record, then waited a moment until the easy beat started to fade, then hit start on the tape deck. The phone conversation played over the monitors and over the air, and at you're the best, Pete, he pushed the start button on the turntable. See, that's how it all works. It's a matter of timing and knowing what's coming next. You ever get to play what you want, or do you have to play? Uh, do you have to stay on the top 40 list? Uh, I stick to the list till about 10:30 or 11. Then I start adding some things I think the listeners will like. You can't get really weird and play far out stuff, but I'll slip in some album cuts, especially from the big groups. You know, the Beatles or the Stones or the Doors. How many people do you think are listening? Hard to say. A few hundred, maybe, maybe more, maybe less. I mean, we're the only game in town. Some people will tune to the clear channels, but we're easier to find. You can get country music from Clarksburg, so we're really the only pop station at night around here that's easy to find. Clay stayed till sign off at midnight. Pete seemed open, friendly, and willing to share what he knew about radio. He even invited Clay to come back anytime. The final segment I'm going to read takes place in Virginia, and this is the day after the election of 1968. 1968 was perhaps the most turbulent year in American history since the end of World War II. Historian John Meacham says 1968 was the first time all Americans could vote freely and openly in a national election. Now, just think about that for a minute. America is 193 years old at this point in 1968, and Meacham says this is the first election that is open and free, the election of 1968. This was a direct result of the passage of the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and the Voting Rights Act of 1965. The race featured Hubert Humphrey against Republican Richard Nixon. The Vietnam War deeply divided the nation. Robert Kennedy's assassination had thrown the Democrats' nominating process wide open, and the party split into two factions over the war. The Democratic Party convention was a mess, as civil unrest, protest, and violent riots played out nightly on the network news. Republican Richard Nixon ran on a platform of law and order and asked for support from the silent majority. Out of this turmoil rose a third-party candidate, 
George Corley Wallace. No relation, I don't think. <laughs> uh, he was a rabid segregationist who ran on a platform of states' rights. Wallace received 45 electoral votes, the most for any third-party candidate in history. The issue of federal versus state control is one of the original debates in this country going back to the ongoing feud between Thomas Jefferson and Alexander Hamilton. Wallace used the backlash against federal efforts to enforce the Voting Rights Act to build momentum for his state's rights campaign. What many people don't realize about the election of 1968 is that had Humphrey won either Ohio or Illinois, the election would have gone to the House of Representatives for the first time since 1824. Nixon won both states by very slim margins, so further chaos was averted. The scene I'm going to read has Clay changing for practice in the locker room, football practice that is, and after his evening practice, he returns home to talk with his dad about the election results. In the scene around the locker, there's Charlie, an introvert, who holds some pretty strong racist views, and Leroy and Audie, the only two black students in Jeffrey County High School. Coach Sammy Suggs desperately needs a winning season. Leroy is an outstanding football talent. Suggs has convinced Leroy and Adi under the freedom of choice rule to transfer from the black high school, Jeffrey Central, to the white high school, Jeffrey County High School, with the promise of increased attention from major college recruiters. We go back to the election of 1968. Clay had stayed up late to watch the election returns and went to bed after midnight not knowing who had won. During lunchtime, Principal Lee announced over the PA system that Humphrey had conceded. Richard Milhouse Nixon would be the next president of the United States. Later, when Clay was putting on his pads for the Wednesday night practice, Charlie decided to offer an opinion to the group. Damn, I thought George Wallace was going to win that election. It was the first time Charlie had said anything to Clay, Leroy, and Adi in weeks. The three exchanged glances at one another before Clay responded. Charlie... Wallace got only 45 electoral votes. He was a long way from winning the election. Charlie did not look at Clay as he jammed his foot into his uniform pants. Ain't right. Something's wrong. Everybody I know wanted Wallace to win. Charlie, Clay slipped his practice jersey over his shoulder pads. There are 50 states. Wallace won five. Wallace didn't even win Virginia. Well, Wallace is the only one that understands states' rights. You watch. He's going to run again, and next time he's going to win. Charlie grabbed his helmet by its face mask and pushed his way past his locker mates. Clay and Leroy smiled as they exchanged knowing glances. The chill in the air and the rhythm of practice were both brisk as the team moved through its paces. Suggs seemed happy with the players' efforts and let them head to the locker room without running wind sprints. Clay was home by 9 o'clock. Slim was sitting in his chair, smoking and reading the evening paper as Clay walked through the door. Hey, Dad, what'd you think about the election? Ah, no big surprise. Nixon ran a good campaign on law and order and the silent majority. Six years ago, after Nixon lost the California governor's race, he said you won't have Dick Nixon to kick around anymore. Well, here he is. Humphrey did better than I thought he would. Yeah, he did. After Chicago, I didn't think old Hubert had any kind of chance at all. If he'd have had two more weeks, he might have won. You know, Dad, I was surprised at the number of people at school who thought Wallace had a chance of winning. I'm not. Wallace played the race card and he won those five deep southern states. Those states used to be Democrat, well, Dixiecrat states. Not so long ago, those people would have voted for Humphrey or whoever the Democrat was. Now they're going to punish the Democrats and Johnson for the Civil Rights Bill. I saw where Johnson told somebody because of the Civil Rights Bill, the Democrats might lose the South for an entire generation. I think he's right. On the way home, I heard on the radio that Humphrey lost Illinois by a hair. If he would have won there, the election would have gone to the House of Representatives for the first time since 1824. Slim pounded his cigarette into the ashtray. You know, that's funny because it was Illinois that gave Kennedy the White House over Nixon in 1960, and now eight years later, Nixon's in the White House because of Illinois. Slim reached over to drink a bourbon and water sitting on the table by his chair. He grabbed the glass and threw the last of the amber liquid back to, uh, to the back of his throat. He let out an audible, ah, then put the glass back on the table. You know, I think Wallace had planned on winning enough electoral votes to throw the election into the House. There, I think he thought there'd be plenty of Southern congressmen to support him, and he'd have the bargaining power to make some kind of deal. But Nixon won Illinois, so now we'll never know. That's kind of scary. Yeah, it is. I guess Tricky Dicky Nixon's better than Wallace. What do you think Nixon's going to do about Vietnam? Who knows? He has a secret plan, and we're supposed to trust him. 
Well, Dad, I'm really tired. I didn't get a lot of sleep last night. I'm going to go upstairs to call Deanna and then go to bed. Good night. Good night. See you tomorrow. Sleep tight. The novel concludes... The novel concludes in the years 1968 and 1969. Both are turbulent years in world and national affairs and in the local setting of rural Jeffrey County, Virginia. Hurricane Camille hits the area with a vengeance. Slim has a life-altering traffic accident and Virginia public schools fully integrate. Mandated integration sparks demonstrations and even a riot at Jeffrey County High School. Clay faces and makes moral decisions that require his values to hold true. Clay literally must fight for what he believes is right. It is a time when the center held true. Thank you. How does this sound? Okay, good, 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 good. Well, I, I love this book. And, and you know, I have so many books to read and all. And, and when Corley sent me the book, I said, I've got to read this book. <laughs> and man, I got into this book and I could not put it down. It was just wonderful. One of the things that interests me about this book is that Corley is choosing a most remarkable period for the country, for Appalachia, for West Virginia, for Virginia, this period in the 1960s, which is a real demarcation for a sea change in the country. And I was a kid in school at that particular time. And I do remember in the Atlanta schools, we had uh, integration for the first time. And I mean, these are times that are just emblazoned in my mind. I thought this was a wonderful thing to do to select for your book, a period that is going to be changing, altering all of our lives, the lives of the country and so on. And I, I love the way that you pull this off. But you also had to give a sense of the times and really pull us back into the 1960s. Well, you know, I'm going to recognize the 1960s pretty well, but how do our students do that? How are our students going to be able to really get a sense of the 60s? So I want to ask you, I mean, I thought it was wonderful. And I, can I ask how many people have read the book? Okay, so Betty and I have. My wife has read the book. So I have to say, you got to get this book and read it. It is, it is an absolutely terrific book. And I think one of the most interesting things about the book is not only the fact that he creates this wonderful verisimilitude about the time, but also this, these moral choices that this kid has to make. And we were all kids at this time, and we were having to make these choices. But how did you, what did you think about, what went through your mind as a writer uh, about how you're going to create the, the times, the ambiance of the times, so that when people read this book, they really feel like they're living in the 1960s? Well, I started by taking my own memories. That's good. And then I, I, I kind of jotted those down, sort of had an outline of, of those memories. And then I started doing some research and going back and making sure that my memories were accurate. <laughs> And, 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 and checking that out. But, uh, but, a, but a lot of that is based on, 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 on personal experience. Um, I worked in radio uh, in college and, and, and right after college. And so, so some of that is, is personal experience. Uh, and like I say, a lot, of, a lot of it is from memory. And some of it's from research. Well, I know one of the things that really does, and only a radio guy would know this, that really does set the time period is the music. So there were all these references to musical groups. The Beatles were in there and all the rest. And that was really terrific how you did that. But you also used movies. Mm -hmm. And I remember these, there were uh, the particular movies that really were life-changing for me, like The Heat of the Night. Mm -hmm. That was a movie that we just talked about and talked about after we saw it. Do you remember this? So I don't know, for the, the younger people in here, have you ever seen the, the Heat of the Night? Really? Okay, good, 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 good. But I thought that, I mean, 
I don't know whether that was part of the research or part of the memory or what, but you did a great job with that. Well, and and my dad actually did get transferred to Virginia, so that so that that part that part is autobiographical. But I also used a a, a smidge out of in the heat of the night because one of the the plot see, one of the, the the part of the plot in the heat of the night is that the new company is coming into town, and the man that is the uh, the man that's the the CEO of the company gets murdered, and and the 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 Tibbs, the uh, the black detective, just happens to be passing through and gets gets pulled into helping to solve the case. We didn't have a we, we didn't have a we didn't have a murder in this story, but we did have a a, a new company coming into a small rural southern town, and so that that is somewhat borrowed from in the heat of the night. So I want to ask one more question, then I want to throw it open to everybody else. I kept as I read this book, I, and and I know Corley, so I was so wondering how much of this story is your story um there's quite a bit of it that uh, that is that is my like say my dad got transferred to virginia and we came in and i remember uh when when i uh, so west virginia to ohio and then to virginia and i remember when we signed up for school and the you know the the guidance counselor pulled out this shit of paper and state law requires that you know i read this to you in virginia you have the freedom of choice to decide where you're going to attend school da 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 of course, you'll want to go to this high school. Check, and that was the that was the process. And so uh, then it was a it was a it was that year that the Supreme Court threw out freedom of choice. It was uh, um, Green versus New Kent County, I believe, was the name of the case. And it actually it actually went back it actually went back to uh, separate but equal because they were saying that you know even though we had this choice. You know, our our schools, you know, don't have, you know, that they, they don't have top notch equipment. They don't have first edition textbooks. They don't have. And so the Supreme Court threw the threw the system out. So the next year we had fully uh, mandated integration. And if you uh, I was also on the high school football team. If you've seen the movie, remember the Titans, which is about, you know, it's about. Well, we were not. Matter of fact, we were opposite of Remember the Titans. Uh, you know, I, I tell people it's just like Remember the Titans, except we lost all our games and nobody got along. And so, you know, it was, uh, you know, it was, it was rough. Uh, there, it was a year or so there that that uh, it was it was it was kind of tough. I mean, there, we had an incident in our school. I wouldn't call it a full blown riot, but we had an incident. We had a fighting in the hall. Somebody set off a, a bomb in the bathroom. Um, so, you know, so, so some of that is drawn from personal experience. Well, I, I do remember you know, growing up in Atlanta and watching integration happen and just feeling such a sense for these. There were two black kids that came into Murphy High School, and I just felt that they were so brave to do what they wanted to do. I did have the opportunity to have one class with a, a, a young black girl and did my best to try to befriend her, but that's hard to do when you have had these separate worlds it was not separate but equal. I will tell you that, that the hand-me-down books in the Atlanta schools all went, you know, after we had spat on them and used them up completely and you could hardly make anything out of them, then they were sent to the black uh, schools and for the black kids. And it was not fair. And growing up, you know, as a kid, I was well aware of this. And I think a lot of my friends were. And um, it it was, my, my husband talks about a life-changing experience for him. He had ridden the bus for his music lesson and gone to Atlanta. And um, there was a rainstorm as they were, he was waiting to get back on the bus and go home after the music lesson with his, with his um, uh, French horn. And there were two black ladies that were standing there. And it started raining and Ray got his horn and he walked, he was getting ready to walk inside uh, one of the cafes, and one of the black ladies looked, and Ray was hearing this, and uh, do you think we should go into the, you know, the, the cafe? And the other lady said no, and they stood out in the rain, and Ray went into the cafe while it was raining, watching those women, and it was, you know, that moment for a child where you see, oh gosh, this is not fair. Something is wrong. And I think Corley really captures these struggles that young people are going through as they're coming to terms with uh, separation and then integration. And uh, it's just really, really well done. Well, I love this book. Uh, but he does go back in time in all of this. And he is 
he is a teacher who has become an author at this point in time. What are the questions that you want to ask Corley Dennison about this story? I'm going to repeat that so that the people can hear it. Why did you decide to make this a novel rather than a memoir? That's a great question. I, there are things that I wanted to embellish, and there are also things that happened in certain places, and I didn't want to tar those places with and something to embellish that didn't perhaps actually happen in that place. So if I would have said it in the real, in, in, a, in the real place and then had this embellished incident, that happened, it might be mistaken for a historical event. So I decided just to keep it a novel so that it was all fiction, but you know, but but fiction's not always fiction. <laughs> so. I think that was a good choice to do it that way as well. You get a lot more freedom in doing that. And then you don't have people going through and say, well, this didn't happen, and you know, this, this, and the other. So that was a that was a very good choice. But I try I tried to make sure that the 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 timelines were always accurate. So I would always, you know, if I was talking about June 1967, I'd go back and see what the, 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 the top news stories were and see what the best-selling books were and what the best movies were and what was number one on TV so I could make some of those. I'm like, oh, yeah, I remember that show. And so I could, I could make those, those references. Another question. When the center held true, the title. So how did you come to this title and why this title? I love the title. I think the title is the main theme of the book. It, it actually was the, my publisher that came up with that. We were, uh, we, I originally, uh, originally I had a, a part, I had a, more of Ohio in, in the book than, and it originally was entitled Appalachian Highway because, you know, you had the, uh, you had the highway from, you know, from, from, of course, if you were in Kentucky, you went to Detroit. If you were in West Virginia, you went to Ohio. And so, you know, and then back down to Virginia, the Blue Ridge Mountains, which are part of the Appalachian. So I had the Appalachian Highway theme. He was like, no, 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 that's too regional. Somebody's going to think, you know, you've got larger themes in there. And so he came up with when the center held true. And, of course, Clay is the center on the, on the football team. Clay also has the, the, the moral issues with, that, that he wants. And, and that, that's part of the book, too, is that, the family, once they, they end up in Virginia, perhaps it was naivete on their part, but, you know, they get transferred, and all of a sudden they're in this basically caste system in, in Virginia. And so the question is, how do you live morally in an immoral system? And so there's there's some discussion about that in the book, and, and, and Clay makes choices, and, you know, some of the choices get him in trouble. Great question. Another question for Corey. Okay, but I grew up in Parkersburg, and I, in 1960, I remember Nixon coming to Parkersburg, and I am embarrassed to say this, I was a Nixon girl. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I remember, I, they, yeah. They, yeah. Mm -hmm. But you didn't know. I didn't know any better. You were naive. Yeah. My, par my parents were old school Republicans, mm -hmm. but, but, but I have always, and you referenced how um, West Virginia helped Kennedy can you talk a little more about that? Sure. Um, and so I was what seven years old or something like that when 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 the when the sixty primary happened. My dad was involved in my dad was involved in in county politics in Braxton County. I'm originally from Sutton, and so my dad my dad was on the town council in Sutton, and so uh, he was he was doing some work for the Kennedy campaign, and so. The, the stories that I had in there were just stories that I heard whether they're true or not you know, yeah but but they were but they were they were stories that I heard you know and that actually particularly in the southern coal fields you still had rather than in the cities where you had your precinct bosses you had your county bosses that pretty much controlled uh, control politics and I think probably Ken Heckler had a lot to do with oh, with yeah. bre breaking up that breaking up that breaking up that system and so you know there was there was always this story 
there was always this story that Humphrey came in and tried to buy all the votes, and then Joe Kennedy came in and 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 paid a higher price and bought the votes back, and and Humphrey didn't, you know, Humphrey really didn't know what hit him, and so I'd kind of heard those stories around the, around the around the table, and so so that's where that that came from, and of course it probably was the most significant primary, uh, in 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 West Virginia history, and I have I do have a memory. It's not as vivid in as the one in the book, but I do have the memory. Kennedy didn't stop in Sutton, but he was driving a motorcade. He was driving up 19, and so there were, Hubert Humphrey came to Sutton, but Kennedy didn't, but the motorcade came by, and my dad went on up to, I believe it was Weston, where they had a rally. I remember he had a straw hat with, you know, Kennedy on it and, and all of that. So I have all those memories from the, uh, from the primary. And, of course, uh, uh, we had a preview of the Kennedy-Nixon debate in West Virginia because you had a Humphrey-Kennedy debate on TV in West Virginia. WCHS TV uh, air, aired a, 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 the debate between Humphrey and Kennedy, and of course Kennedy did quite well, and he was very good on TV and did quite well in the in the debate. So that's a you know that that's an embellished story of a, of a childhood memory that I have. And 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 interestingly, after Kennedy was assassinated, my dad stopped politics. He never did. Of course, we had moved to Ohio, but he he was no longer active. In politics, after after Kennedy got assassinated, I don't know if you know there, but uh, but he wasn't. Um, so I mean, I remember you know I remember my mother hosting, uh, having parties you know for different Democratic candidates that would you know come through and at the house and and doing some work for the for the Democratic Party. And that's something that we need to point out is that in that time, what a Democratic state West Virginia was. I mean that has. That has flipped completely, right? But I mean, West Virginia was very democratic, and so you know, Slim in the book is a blue-collar Democrat, and you know that was that was the Democratic base at that at that time in the 1960s, and that has completely flipped. That whole script has flipped. So, so, so it's 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 memories that I have, and again, I did you know I did some research on it, and uh, uh, so it's a it's a combination of embellishment and and research. The best kind of writing. So we have time for one more question. Is there one more question that you want to ask? We have politicians in here. Does a politician want to ask us a question? <laughs> Not anymore. Not anymore. <laughs> <laughs> the voters said no. <laughs> well, the voters say no. The voters say yes. What can you say? Uh, this is a really wonderful book. And I think what Corley does so well in this book is he captures an age. He does it in just a terrific way. So, I mean, as I'm reading this and, you know, remembering as well, I'm thinking, wow, he did a lot of research for this. But it's interesting to me that there's a lot of your personal experience in politics as well that comes through in this. And, and uh, you know, sort of going back to, to, the, to the beginning of my talk, you know, I really did realize that a lot of the issues in the book are still issues today. And, and, you know, it, it's, it's, it's just this, uh, you know, I mean, you think about, you know, the issues of, of slavery and the Constitution, the Civil War, Reconstruction, the 1960s, you know, Jim Crow, the 1960s, now it's voter access, and, you know, and it's, it's, it, it's, a, it's a continual theme, a thread that has run through our country. And, you know, we have to teach that as a, that, 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 it, that is sort of, sort of, sort of the, I think I think it was Faulkner that said, you know, the original sin, that you know it 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 run, it runs through American history. I mean that I think that is a very good way to end this. But we're going to first have a question. Yes. So that is your question. <laughs> Yes. 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 I played center, and and I, I was a little bit small. And my uncle, who was my, my uncle, was a real athlete, and he said you ought to try. And I really wanted to play football. He goes, well, you ought to try center because I wasn't fast enough to be in the backfield. So he said you ought to try center because at that time centers always were a little bit smaller than the guards and the tackles. So he was like, you ought to try center. And maybe you have a shot. He was right. And because everybody played a six-man cornerback. Yeah, that's right. That's exactly right. Mm -hmm. Well, I think that what this book is telling us is that we have come full circle. 
And, you know, as I was growing up and I was thinking, all of these issues have been settled. I don't have to worry about my human rights. I don't have to worry about my rights as a woman anymore. And things are getting better with race relationships. And, you know, uh, the center does hold true, but the pendulum seems, seems to swing back and forth and back and forth. I think Corley uh, Dennison has written a wonderful book. You must read this book. It is a book that is just as timely today as it would have been when the story took place in the 1960s. So uh, let's give Corley a hand and join us outside for the reception. Thank you.